Hi, this is Rachel from Ray K Books, and today I'm going to be interviewing the amazing Jennifer Longo. Hello, Jen. Hi. Hello. So today we are going to promote your debut novel, Six Ooh. Feet Over It. Exciting. Can you please tell everybody a synopsis of that book? Yeah, it's about a girl growing up in a graveyard. Her her parents buy a graveyard, and she's 14 when they buy it, and they put her to work in it. And it's a rough time. <laughs> Interesting. That's basically it. Oh, okay, I was I was waiting for a little bit. No, that's basically it. So I kind of first want to talk about the cover because mm -hmm. it's a beautiful cover. It's, yeah. it's so beautiful. It's with a woman who is um, leaning against a tombstone, and she's kind of, her face is to the sky. Can you, like, why why did you have a book cover like that? Is that from a, um, a scene of the book, or is there, like, a, a reason why that scene is happening? They chose, Random House chose the cover completely. I had no say in it at all, and they were going to do a graphic... They, were, they had different graphics ready. They were going to have butterflies coming up out of a grave and a bunch of stuff like that. And then when the cover was revealed, which I saw it as, you know, the same day everybody else did, it was this, and it's just a stock photo. And I think it's just trying to convey this girl, which she doesn't really look like what the character looks like, but she's a girl sitting in a graveyard alone, and there's a lot of that in the book, so I think that's why they chose it, and it's, I think it's beautiful, and it's striking, and people really like it, it's, it's really, it's, um, attention grabbing on the shelf, so I hope it gets people to pick it up and take a look, it, it definitely has the vibe of the book, so I'm really happy with it. So, the, does the character on the cover, does it kind of resemble the main character in any way? It does. In a way, like my husband, when I first got it, I was like, that's not at all what she would, a lot of people, not a lot, there are some people saying in reviews that the cover is completely doesn't match what they're reading because the girl in the book owns one pair of pants, like her whole life, and she doesn't own any makeup, and she is very shy and just wears jeans and a ratty t-shirt every day, and this girl's pretty cute, she's got a skirt on, and, but my husband's like, you know what, it's aspirational, because at the end of the book, she does learn to pull a brush through her hair and put on a skirt and so in in a way yeah so it's supposed to reflect the main character very nice well i enjoy the cover i think that it's oh, beautiful good. yes so what give us a little bit of insight on the main character what makes her so special i think the way she deals with what's thrown at her she's there's a lot of death going on in her life and in her family's life and then her her father, unbeknownst to her, buys a graveyard and just moves the whole family into it. And while she's complaining loudly in, in her head, she tries to just shut up and do what she's supposed to do without complaining. And even though she's amazed at what her parents expect of her, she just does it because she's trying to protect her sister and some other people. And I think it's she's kind of the adult in the entire family. There are no adults as parents, there's no adults anywhere. And I think that's always unique in a person when they, despite their age, can be the adult in a situation and take care of it when no one else will take care of what needs to be done. So since they're living in a graveyard, is this a paranormal? Or are there going to be like ghosts or anything? No, it's completely contemporary. It's A lot of the details are based on um, my family owned our town cemetery. My dad bought it without telling anybody, <laughs> which was delightful. And we all, all the kids worked there. And there's a lot of things happened that I've always written my whole life, and I would take notes about this. And I thought, eh, that would be interesting in a book. And a lot of those moments are in the book. So what is? So you spent a lot of time in the graveyard. Is there anything like? It seems kind of creepy because it's a graveyard. Exactly. But, so, were you were you kind of creeped out sometimes when you were working in a graveyard? The creepiest thing I think is that a friend and a classmate, um, when we were in fifth grade, died. She was the first person I knew who died, and she was buried in our in the graveyard that my parents bought. 
and for a long time that just felt awful. It was just really strange and wrong and but the headstones were all flat including hers and after a while as I grew up and would work there doing different jobs it started to feel less creepy and more just quiet and peaceful. I mean my friends were all working at like McDonald's and different places that they hated and I got to be out in the fresh air and picking up rocks and stuff and planting flowers and it it was nice and yeah you, you know you have to anyway eventually so it was okay. So death has to do it like you don't this is something touchy so if you don't want to go into this this is fine but oh. death has to go is kind of with religion like what happens after you die what happens all that stuff so what do you believe happens once someone dies what what how, like what do you think of religion aspect I was raised as some of the characters are in the book in a hardcore atheist household and so but my grandparents were all really religious. <laughs> that, must, <laughs> that must have been great. Yeah, when their children's like, oh, I don't believe in anything. <laughs> yeah, my grandma would make us say these, just these prayers at bedtime, this litany of stuff, and I'd be like, who is this Jesus person? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> then we'd go home, my parents would be all mad. What do they name it? And it was, and so there was a lot of just, my parents would get really angry at laziness because their whole thing is you get one life, this is it. When you die, there's nothing. And so I guess what I've decided to settle on is that it's a lovely, beautiful mystery and I don't really need to know or care to know as long as you've loved people well and they have loved you, that it's okay because whatever is going on is we'll never know and I really don't think it's anything bad I just don't see any kind of anything physically but I don't think that we ever leave I just feel like that we aren't our bodies even when we're here and when your body goes you're just there you're so there. you know live in the moment pretty much yeah and and just God be a good person Mm -hmm. and live a good life because we don't know and there's no reason to be a jerk about it and that is comforting very true I haven't actually like never mind I'm not gonna go there um <laughs> so my next question is which actress would you like to see playing the lead character from your six feet over it under it, over oh, it. I've thought a lot about this um Hi, my daughter's getting ready for ballet. Um, I have thought a lot about this girl, Julia Goldani Tellis. There was a short-lived show on ABC Family called Bunheads. It was about some ballerinas. And there's this girl that kind of was one of the leads on that show who is amazing. And she's very kind of gloomy and dark and but very smart and very funny and I think she would be great. Very nice. So this is your debut novel that is so exciting, your first book. And from a big five publisher too, so that's also yeah. huge. So when they bought your book, what was your reaction? Uh, I just, I think like most people would say I could not believe it we had we had pitched it to 28 editors 28 wow. editors, and most of them wanted spec revisions so I'd be revising for months and then they would respond with like a one sentence email just sorry and then somebody else would want it and ask for revisions and we were just doing this and doing this and doing this and then Random House just one day said oh we love it it's great the way it is we'll take it and I was like uh what it was amazing wow and it was Leaf, because I was about to just put it in a drawer and work on something else. Because I think there's a time when you need to let go and know that you know forcing this is just not going to make it any better or make it any different. But right under the wire, Random House came in. It was amazing. Wonderful. I again, congratulations. Thank you. So now that you are an author, a published author, Ooh. do you have any other works coming up? I just submitted the first draft of my second novel 
well, a second draft of my first novel to my agent and my editor. And it is about a ballerina who realizes too late that she will never be a professional. She's like 17 and her body's just not going to do it. So she kind of freaks out and goes to winter over in Antarctica to figure things out. So I'm, I'm assuming that this is based on your daughter who's going to ballerina classes right now. <laughs> no, I was a dedicated ballerina from the ages of 8 to 18. And... I always thought I was pretty good, but I think I was, and I also had just horrible turnout and terrible extension, and there's a point when you're about 12 that that comes to light, but I just kept dancing, and by the time I was 17, 18, it's a hard thing, you know, to realize, and you spend your whole life working for something, and then you realize it's not about hard work. You can work as hard as you can, but sometimes it's just not... You know, when you find out cards. Yeah, totally. And then it's that's a my new book is about what do you do with that? Do you kind of give up and lay down and die and not do anything? Or do you change direction and find a new path? So I think it's a really interesting question. It's very, very interesting indeed. Um, and also inspirational. Yeah, I think a lot of times people a lot of young people I know lately have it. It's kind of a problem that my generation has as well, where if something doesn't work out the first time, you just sort of, I give up. And then you're 40 and living in your parents' basement, and that's no way to be. <laughs> you got to keep trying. That's very true. You do have to keep trying. And I, I agree with you. I know a lot of people, once you fail, you're just like, eh, I'm going to do something else, whatever. Yeah. You, got, you don't try and try again, and that's what... That's what your teachers tell you. Just try and try again. Exactly. I mean, even with this book, if I'd given up after the first 10 agents or the first 20 or the first 15 editors, it's, you know, okay, if you spend five years and 50 people, yeah, it may be time to move on. But if you know there's something there, yeah. I just found the cover. This is the cover of the book. Isn't it pretty? I love it. I love it, too. Um... So if you could have been the original author of any book, uh, I lost my place, what what would it have been and why? Oh, my gosh. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because a lot of interviews ask what your favorite books are. And um, A Gift from the Sea by Anne Murrow Lindbergh is this book. She's a pilot and an artist and a writer, and it's this book that she wrote when she was like probably my age. She was in her 40s and she she took a week and went to their beach house. She and Charles Lindbergh had this beach house, like a ratty little shack. And so she goes to this house for a week and walks on the beach and just writes about what it is to live a good life every day when you are a mother, when you are a wife, when you're just a person and a citizen of the world and what do you do with your time and what's important. And I mean it sounds totally corny, but it's just this beautiful, simple book that reminds you just to slow down and not be afraid to say no, and don't you don't have to say yes to every single invitation, and yes to every single offer of, you know, every single opportunity or request for help or something. It's okay to say, I have to be alone right now, or I need some time, and it's this lovely book, and every time I read it, I think, God, that writing is so good, I wish I had written that. It's beautiful. That's great. Yeah. I love it. I love inspirational books. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you were stranded on a desert island, which character of your newest novel would you want by your side? Oh, Eleanor. Oh my gosh. She's the best friend in the book, and she's just well. Dario the grave digger is great too, but I think Eleanor and Lee, the main character, have more in common. She's this amazing, forgiving friend who's smart and funny and is a straight shooter and says what she means and is generous and fun and would probably think of a way to get off the island and be able to build a boat. She's awesome. And so now we're going to play a game called <laughs> Would You Rather. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what Would You Rather is, I would ask Jen here, would you something like would you rather eat apples or oranges for the rest of your life and then she'd have to say apples or oranges but this is literature edition Yay. so the first one is would you rather 
fight next to Hermione from Harry Potter or Katniss from the Hunger Games? Oh my god. I think... I think Hermione. I mean, Katniss is a badass, but Hermione's always got something that is <laughs> when her back's against the wall, she'll think of some damn spell you never even thought of. She's amazing. She'll just t teleport you somewhere. She's, yeah. Oh, I love her. Oh, she's and, a little softer, too. Katniss is really, <laughs> she's hard. Oh, yeah, she is. <laughs> and she takes a lot of mental abuse. It's, it's. Yeah. Crazy. Like, okay. So, the second one is, would you rather read a book that is written poorly but has an excellent story or read one with weak content but is written well? Definitely written well with weak content. I'm okay with a wandering plot as long as, you know. Like I tried it, we talked earlier, I had started to read the, the Twilight books because I thought, they, you know, it looks so fun, it's such a great story. And the plot's great, the plot really moves along. And I did this with that Dan Brown book too, what was that, oh my gosh. Um, the one about finding clues and Jesus and all that. Oh my God, I forget the name of it. But I don't know. I'm sorry. There's, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah. Da Vinci Code. Yes, the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. It was, and um, you know, I'm not a writer in my first book, but it just there were so many things that just tripped me up about the writing. When you think, oh come on, really? That's like grammatically wrong. That's like you're using double negatives. It trips me up too much. So I think I'd much rather have writing that's just good and easy. And then the third one is, who would you rather have as a child, Harry Ooh. Potter or Hermione Granger? Oh, my gosh. I think I'm going to go Hermione again because Harry is so, I love him, but, oh, my God, he's so tortured and <laughs> nasal-gazing and inward, and, oh, I love him, but he would be exhausting, and Hermione is so... Brave and smart, and so is Harry. But I don't know. I she's a good one. She's such a good character. I I love her so much, and she doesn't put up with crap, and she doesn't get swayed easily. She doesn't. Harry is, seems, and rightly so. He is so desperate for love. He's so desperate to feel right and to do the right thing. And Hermione just sort of knows who she is. And I'd like to hang out with a kid like that. Very true. <laughs> The next one is: Would you would you rather only write your books in trilogies or standalones? Standalones. I've never really gotten into the trilogies. I don't think that, I, as far as you know, writing and trying to do that. I really love standalones. I love a story. I love it to be what it is and figure out the arc and have it there. And I, it's a challenge, and I like I like that. I like reading standalones. I like writing them. And the next one is, would you rather write a book without using conjunctions or have every sentence of your book begin with one? Without. I'm not, bye, they're going to ballet. <laughs> I'm not a fan of conjunctions at all to begin with. And people have said, oh, her writing is so choppy. And I'm like, that's just because I don't like conjunctions. <laughs> and then the next one is, would you rather write a plot twist you hated or write a character you hated? Oh, God. Oh, that's such a good question. Because a plot twist can then affect the entire rest of the book. But a character, you know, I guess I'll pick character because then I can just kill him off quickly. <laughs> and a plot twist would mess a lot of stuff up. <laughs> that's very true. You just And you can also write it in a very brutal way if you don't like them. Exactly. And I can have the other characters call them out. So. <laughs> yep. And then the next one is, would you rather a super successful movie be made from one of your books or a long-lasting television series? You know, lately television is so great. I think I might go television. There's so many. Go oh, my gosh. I've been watching all this stuff on Netflix. Television is better than, than movies sometimes. They get a chance to really tell the story and drag it out and get all the details. I love it. It's, oh my gosh, true detective. I just got through watching and yeah, I think I'd go television. Awesome. 
And then the last one is, would you rather critics rip your book apart publicly or never talk about it at all? Ugh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is so hard. Oh, I guess have them rip it apart because at least they're paying attention and there's something that upset them or made them mad because no, if no one talks about it, it's... I mean, that's what I do. I never put up, if I ever review a book on my website or if I go on Goodreads, I never, ever put up a bad review because if I didn't like something, I just don't give it any attention or time. I just don't bother. So I only review books that I like. So, and that's, to me, that would be, oh, it's so sad. <laughs> it's just off in oblivion. <laughs> At least if you got reviews, people go, oh, yeah, that one book that everybody hated. <laughs> right. No, that's true. And that concludes our Would You Rather game. Yay! <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to an answer that you just gave about television series. So yeah. do you binge watch on Netflix at all? I have just started. I've never seen um, Breaking Bad. And I, I watch TV while I'm on my treadmill or doing my arm exercises. And... Um, somehow I avoided any spoilers. I didn't know anything about Breaking Bad or what happened or who died or who didn't. And I was watching, I was staying up way too late when I was done writing. I would sit there and go, oh my gosh. I was watching like three episodes a day and I just powered through the whole thing. I love it. And I like consuming TV like that. I like binge watching and then I don't have to watch TV for a long time. It's instead of waiting every week, oh my gosh. It was wonderful. It was like a 15 hour movie. I loved it. Oh, so really? Yeah, sorry. I, I wasn't yawning because you're boring. Oh, no. I swear. <laughs> you were just looking at me like, <clears throat> I was like, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I could not be into uh. <laughs> Have you seen that? Have you seen Breaking Bad? I have not. Oh, I bet you love it. When it first started, this tells you how long it's taken to get my book published. When, it, when I first got my agent, she called me one day and said, you have to watch Breaking Bad. Oh, my God, it's so amazing. And I was like, I don't have cable, I can't. And now I finally have it. So great. Good. I'm glad that I, I know a lot of people that like Breaking Bad. Plus, they win a lot of awards. You saw the Emmys. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was great. And I just moved to Seattle, and I just binge watched all of The Killing, which is a show set in Seattle. And a couple of the murder suspects were um, living on the island that I live on, so that was exciting. <laughs> yeah. They always set gloomy so. murder shows. Twin Peaks and all that stuff is always in Seattle, and it's kind of unfair. It's very cheerful here. Well, yeah, I just moved to New York, and now that everything's set in New York, I'm like, oh, my God, I know that street. Yeah, oh, well, there's a store I go to. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, I know. It was, it's really interesting now that you're in the city that, like, many shows are in, you know. Every great movie and so many books. Oh, that must be magical. That's yeah. awesome. Every apocalypse movie, the apocalypse <laughs> starts here. Like, Absolutely, and it's gonna end there. Yeah, I've, yeah. Like I'm the first to die if there is an apocalypse. Oh, God forbid, but you know. Um, so we're almost out of time, so I have a few more questions for you. Okay. And the first one is, uh, how much research did you do for this book? I did a lot of research about uh, Mexico, about the different cities and states, about the, um, the butterfly migration and the traditions of the Day of the Dead. I had a lot of friends who are native Spanish speakers writing and editing dialogue for me. I did so much research on that. What I didn't do a ton of research on was the cemetery business because I relied on what I wanted it to ring true with the character knowing what she knew only, and her experience in the cemetery, which is exactly what, what my experience was. And, you know, if I, I mean, of course I fact-checked and made sure that everything I was writing, you know, that my memory was serving me correctly. But, you know what I mean, like I didn't go hang out in cemeteries and find out what, you know, what wacky new techniques they use today because I wanted it to be a fresh experience as it was to her. So everything that I experienced living and working in the cemetery is what this character knows and does. Did you, uh, put, did you put a little of yourself in this character? 
she started off completely just from journal entries. When I was writing stuff about, oh my god, we bought this cemetery, oh my god, my friend is in here, what is going on? And gradually, at, with each revision and with each edit, she became this character and, you know, less and less. And again, I think a lot of debut authors, you know, every first play that someone writes first, you kill your father. You know, everyone always has their thing where they, they write what they know best and this was, it started off as a memoir in graduate school. This was a play and it was a solo show that was an hour long, just memories of living in this graveyard. And as it evolved from the solo show to a full length two act play into this novel, it's a completely different story. It's a completely different character, but she was definitely based in my reality and in my experiences. Yeah. But she is much smarter and braver and funnier than I could ever hope to be. She's way different now than me. Well, so since she's based on you, basically, yeah. what about the side characters? Are they based on anybody in your life? The, <laughs> the parents are a lot of moments and things that my parents did and said growing up are definitely in there, but they're, you know, at this point they're also fiction, but there's a lot of good details that are about them, and our grave digger began as the grave digger that we had in our cemetery as well. But I did not have the relationship with him that, that Lee has with Dario. But he did let me dig a grave with him once, and he did tell me about the Day of the Dead, and he was very kind to me and was kind to all of the, the, the customers that came in. And he still works there, and he's this wonderful person. And he, yeah, he's a good guy. So, yeah. Great. And so do you have any advice for aspiring writers? I do. Um, you know, I would definitely advise brand new writers to find an agent, find an agent that's willing to stick to the same guns that you are, but someone that you trust to let you know where you're holding on to things that aren't necessary. There were things about this book that I refused to move an inch about and it would have cost me ever getting it published and I had a really great editorial agent who guided me around what to let go of and what to hold on to. I think we had to pitch, she had to pitch that many editors because she was sticking up for the things I refused to do in the book and refused to change but she completely believed in it and when she did that it made me trust her absolutely with the things that she was like you have to let this go, you know. And it's always hard with the first book and you think, oh, it has to, but that, you know, first author, <laughs> you know, rookie mistakes, we don't know how it works. And having someone that you trust, an agent that you trust to guide you through this is everything. It's, it's everything. So do research when you're querying, you know, agents. Ask other authors. Research the heck out of them. And and be lucky. <laughs> I got I, I hit the agent jackpot. Oh my god, I love my agent. <laughs> That's exciting. Well good for you. Thank you. Very good. So what draws you to the contemporary genre? My favorite thing to read in life is memoir. I my whole life have loved it when people sit and tell me stories. Like if my parents, well they hardly ever did, and when they did, I was just hanging on everywhere. I, I do not know why. I love it. I love it. When, I'll sit and listen to someone forever. What was your fifth grade like? And they'll just tell me. One of my favorite writers is Garrison Keillor, and that's all he does. He sits there and tells the same five stories about this town in Minnesota over and over again, about the different people that live there. I just love it. I love documentaries. I love, and to me, I think that's contemporary is the close, you know, it's basically memoir but made up. I, I love it. To me there's nothing more interesting than, than the typical, than the usual, than what happens every day. There's infinite, it's like the difference between exploring the ocean and exploring outer space. It's, the universe is endless and to me that's so easy in a way. Like it's, it's amazing and I love it and I love God, science and astronomy. But the ocean is right here. Like we live in the ocean. We came from the ocean, and we'll never reach even a fraction of the depths of exploring it. It's it's amazing. I just so contemporary for me is more interesting than stuff that can be made up. And maybe it's because I have no imagination. Clearly, this whole book 
from stuff <laughs> that I lived. But my next book is totally made up and stuff that I'm fascinated with with other people's lives in Antarctica and explorers and stuff. So I'm branching out. <laughs> well, what's... Oh, we're out of time. Okay, let me do one more question. Okay. How did you come up with the title? Oh, Six Feet Over It? I did not. My editor did. The original title was At Need, which was an allusion to the kind of grave that you buy at the time of need, and also because Lee and so many of the characters are literally at need. They're in need of something. So I thought it was very mystical and metaphorical. And Random House did not. They were like, yeah, no one's going to know what this means. <laughs> and that was another time I had to trust my agent. She was like, yeah, nobody knows what it means. And yeah, you find out on the first page, but that's not enough. You need something to grab them. So my agent, I mean my editor, figured out something that conveys the sort of sassiness of the character. When things get dark, she just gets sassy. And it's it makes it pretty clear what the story's about. I, I, we agonized over it for weeks and couldn't come up with anything. And then my editor just thought of this perfect, yeah, I love it. It's a really good title. Great. And now I'm going to talk about the giveaway because what? Jen here is going to yeah. give away a book. Is that uh, exciting? Sorry? Yep, that one right there. And uh, so this is for USA and Canada only. And what you have to do is this live chat is going to become a YouTube video. And once it's a YouTube video, comment on the video. And then the second thing, this is extra points but optional, is to follow Jen on Twitter. And if you follow her, then put your um, username in the comment so I can verify the entry. And this will end next Wednesday. So third, fourth is six, seven, eight, nine. So the, like the tenth, I believe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, yep, the tenth. And um is that it? yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Jen. I had a great time talking with you. Thank you so much, you too. And the book will be accompanied by a lot of goodies having to do with the story. So enter often. <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you, and I'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Later.